The strong wind signal number three now in force, and there may be the need for a higher signal tomorrow. The U.S. announces criminal charges against Hamas leaders. Hello, I'm Melissa Hekalea, and this is TVB News. The strong wind signal number three is currently in force. The observatory may need to issue higher tropical cyclone warning signals between tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow night. This in accordance with the strength and distance of Typhoon Yagi. Timothy Lee tells us more. Yagi is edging ever closer to Hong Kong, but people seem to be more concerned with the sweltering heat than the strong winds. Several areas around the city recorded maximum temperatures of 33 degrees Celsius or above, with places such as Taku Ling and Yunlong recording 35 degrees. Some individuals who went to the harbor said the heat was less severe near the shore. This woman said the weather was really stuffy and that there was no breeze away from the pier. While this man said the breeze there didn't make much of a difference amid the hot conditions. The observatory earlier forecasted weather conditions would turn for the worse, with heavy rainfall and thunderstorms expected soon to hit the city. Yagi began strengthening this morning and was upgraded from a severe tropical storm to a severe typhoon. According to weather satellite imagery, Yagi's atmospheric circulation covers almost the entire South China Sea. The typhoon's spiral rain bands are also within 200 kilometers of Hong Kong. The latest forecast indicated Yagi will be further upgraded to a super typhoon between Thursday afternoon and Friday and will pass by the southwest of Hong Kong at a distance of 400 kilometers. Dr. Yuan Kuo Cheng, a senior scientific officer from the observatory, said rain bands associated with Yagi are currently affecting the coastline of eastern Guangdong. Weather authorities noted the typhoon is set to move west through the north of the South China Sea before picking up speed later tonight. This as winds are expected to strengthen around the Pearl River Delta tomorrow. Weather authorities reminded residents to stay away from the shore and seize all water-related activities. Meanwhile, the typhoon signal number one is still in effect in Macau and expected to remain throughout the day. Local meteorological authorities said there is a high possibility of upgrading the typhoon signal to number three tomorrow morning owing to strengthening winds. There is a medium to relatively high possibility of the typhoon signal number eight being issued tomorrow night. Timothy Lee, TVB News. The police are continuing their search for evidence at the scene of Monday night's fatal car crash on the Shenzhen Bay Bridge. The car plunged into the sea after the crash and Marine Police personnel searched the waters nearby for vehicle parts today. The wreckage of the vehicle is being kept at the Tai Lam Chung Police Vehicle Pound. Authorities earlier recovered an assortment of items from the scene of the accident, including the body of a large doll. The victim of the crash, a customs officer, was driving to work on the Shenzhen Bay Bridge when the accident happened. The Kai Tak Sports Park is scheduled to be completed in the first quarter of next year. Sources say British rock band Coldplay could be set to hold a concert at the new arena. Authorities are also reportedly mulling whether to build a public transport interchange near the arena. Timothy Lee reports. Fans of British rock band Coldplay might soon have the chance to listen to their favorite musicians live at the Kai Tak Sports Park next year. Sources say a private company has planned to hold a Coldplay concert at the arena after the park's completion in the first quarter of 2025. The band is reportedly set to arrive in the city in the second quarter of the year. But owing to the park having a capacity of just around 60,000 people, many have questioned arrangements for people flow. Reports that the government was initially planning to use an empty plot of land near the Sung Wan Toy MTR station as a public transport interchange. Special buses would be arranged there during large-scale concerts or events. This, as some in the property development sector noted, considerations for public transport capacity were made during the early planning stages of the arena, but new assessments are necessary. 
Meanwhile, lawmaker Kenneth Falk from the Sports, Performing Arts, Culture and Publication Constituency voiced his concerns about the development of water sports facilities near the park. He said there are currently a number of vessels that have docked at a nearby typhoon shelter, which may affect the measure and quality of the nearby water supply. Responding to the concerns, Secretary for Development Bernadette Lin said the water quality has drastically improved, stressing it is safe to conduct water sports in the area. Timothy Lee, TVB News. A former aide to two New York governors was charged with acting as an illegal agent of the Chinese government. Linda Sun allegedly used her positions to advance Beijing's agenda in exchange for financial benefits worth millions of dollars. Tracy Furness has more. 41-year-old Linda Sun and her husband, 40-year-old Chris Hu, pleaded not guilty to criminal charges before U.S. Magistrate Judge Peggy Kuo in Brooklyn Tuesday. Sun and Hu said nothing as they left court. Sun served as Deputy Diversity Officer for former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and Deputy Chief of Staff for the incumbent Governor Kathy Hochul. Sun was charged with secretly acting as an agent of the Chinese government. Prosecutors say Sun blocked Taiwanese officials from meeting the governor and adjusted New York's messaging to fit Chinese priorities. In return, whose business in China thrived, allowing them to buy expensive properties and luxury items, including a 2024 Ferrari. Sun's actions reportedly gave China influence in New York's government for nearly a decade. Her lawyer calling the charges perplexing and overly inflammatory. We have a lot of confidence in our case. A lot of the allegations in this indictment are frankly perplexing, overly inflammatory. As you heard in court today, we're looking forward to our day in court. The defendants are exercising their right to a speedy trial as soon as they can. We have a lot of confidence in Chris and in Linda. Sung was released on a $1.5 million bond and Hu a $50,000 bond. Hokel was not accused of any wrongdoing. Her office fired Sun in March of 2023 after discovering evidence of misconduct. The FBI searched the couple's $3.5 million home in Manhasset on Long Island's North Shore in late July, but declined to release further details. Sun had worked in state government for about 15 years. Tracy Furness, TVB News. The United States announced criminal charges against Hamas leaders over their roles in the October 7th attack on southern Israel, which started the war in Gaza. Hamas also took hostages, and Israel is split on whether the country should try to reach a ceasefire deal or continue its military activity in Gaza and the West Bank. David Garrett reports. I have not been able to stop thinking about Hirsch and his parents. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff, speaking at a vigil for the six Israeli hostages killed in Gaza. Hirsch Goldberg Pollin was only 23 years old and a native of California. The President and Vice President have said Hamas is responsible for killing in cold blood, execution style, Hirsch. Ori, Carmel, Alex, Almo, Eden, and too many others. And Hamas's leaders will pay for these crimes. The U.S. Justice Department unsealed charges against Hamas leaders for ordering the October 7th attack. It is seen as a symbolic move. Three of the named defendants are dead. Today, the Justice Department unsealed charges against Yahya Sinwar and other senior leaders of Hamas for financing and directing a decades-long campaign to murder American citizens and endanger the security of the United States. As outlined in our complaint, those defendants, armed with weapons, political support, and funding from the government of Iran and support from Hezbollah, have led Hamas's efforts to destroy the state of Israel and murder civilians in support of that aim. In Israel, protesters lit a bonfire and scuffled with police as they continue to vent their anger at the government for not doing more to get a ceasefire deal done and bring hostages home alive. 
They want the immediate release of around 100 captives still believed to be held by Hamas in Gaza. Israel is split. Others are of Benjamin Netanyahu's opinion that destroying Hamas and ensuring Israel's security is the priority. Politicians from both sides are making the case. A former member of Netanyahu's war cabinet, Benny Gantz, doubts the sincerity of the country's leader. In a strongly worded statement, Gantz told Israelis... The Prime Minister did not look the public in the eye and tell the truth that he won't bring back the hostages alive. Israel's military raids on the West Bank are now into an eighth day, with Palestinian protesters and Israeli soldiers clashing. Armoured bulldozers tore through large stretches of Jenin, aided by hundreds of Israeli troops, helicopters and drones. The operation has caused severe damage to the city's infrastructure. Israel says it is a preemptive attack against militant Palestinian groups. Israel says it has killed 14 militants. The Red Crescent accused Israeli forces of blocking ambulances. Palestinian health officials say more than 30 people have died, including five children, in a week of violence. David Garrett, TVB News. Still ahead, Pope Francis officially welcomed to Indonesia by President Joko Widodo. The ICAC files charges against a police chief inspector and his wife. And 20 more paintings from the Ming Dynasty now on display at the Palace Museum. Welcome back. Pope Francis praised Indonesia's delicate balance and diversity and warned against religious extremism on day two of his visit to the world's most populous Muslim-majority country. The Pope also met with Indonesian President Joko Widodo and both called for stronger interfaith peace efforts to resolve conflicts around the world. Danny Cho has the story. This morning, crowds gathered at Jakarta's Merdeka Presidential Palace, eagerly waiting for the arrival of Pope Francis, the first pontiff to visit the country in 35 years. The 87-year-old head of the Catholic Church was greeted by Indonesia's outgoing president, Joko Widodo, alongside president-elect Prabowo Subianto. A welcome ceremony was held outside the palace. In his first address during the apostolic journey, the Pope urged Indonesians to live up to the promise of harmony in diversity. He noted that politicians have a particular role to play in maintaining such balance while the church will ramp up efforts toward interreligious dialogue to tamp down extremism, which, he says, distorts religions through deception and violence. This as Indonesia suffered incidents of extremist violence in recent years, including suicide bomb attacks by a terrorist group inspired by the Islamic State. Widodo, who will step down in October, thanked the Pope for his appeal for a ceasefire in Gaza. In the afternoon, the Pope met clergy and nuns at a cathedral for the traditional pep talk to the local church. He will on Thursday meet leaders of various faiths and sign a joint declaration with the Grand Imam of the Istiqlal Mosque in Jakarta. The declaration is to address the dehumanization brought by violence, conflict and environmental degradation, with a special focus on the impact on women and children. Danny Joe, TVB News. The Independent Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC, has charged a police chief inspector and his wife with accepting cash and gifts worth over $1.14 million. Chief Inspector Ho Su Tung was accused of accepting benefits from a merchant between August 2021 and January 2023. Allegedly, the bribes include two cash payments totaling $1 million and gifts worth more than $140,000. The cash and gifts were meant to be rewards for Ho, who had allegedly favored the merchant in two criminal investigations. The officer was also accused of misconduct in public office for divulging police internal information to the merchant on many occasions. Meanwhile, Ho's wife, Ho Ying Veng, was charged with a count of aiding, abetting, counseling, or procuring a public servant to accept advantages. The two were granted bail. They will appear at Eastern Magistrates Court on Friday. 
A Hong Kong court today overturned a communications authority ruling that an episode of a now defunct RTHK program had breached the broadcasting ordinance. Mimo Singai reports. The episode of the RTHK satirical program Headliner was aired on February 14, 2020, with the content focusing on the pandemic. In the scene, actor Won Hae, dressed in police uniform, jumped up of a bin with his hands and neck wrapped in rubbish bags. The communications authority later ruled the scene was an insult to the police. Another scene in question was about allegations that the police had excessive full body protective gowns and masks. The communications authority issued a warning to RTHK and said the broadcaster had failed to ensure the accuracy of factual contact in that scene. The RTHK program staff union and the Hong Kong Journalists Association sought a judicial review. The court of first instance upheld the communications authority's decision on the Warren Hay scene but overturned the other. The two organizations, as well as the Communications Authority, separately appealed against the court decision. A three-judge panel of the Court of Appeal handed down its ruling today. The judges overturned the appeal of the Communications Authority and upheld that RTHK did not violate the broadcasting ordinance in the second scene of the episode involved. With regards to the Warren Hay scene, Judge Jeremy Poon said while headliner is satirical, a bottom line needs to be drawn. Poon ruled RTHK had breached the ordinance. Meanwhile, the other two judges said the scene did not target the social status of the police, but the forced COVID fighting measures. The court ordered the communications authority to remove the relevant warning on RTHK. Memes 9, TVB News. The three-day Asia Fruit Logistica, which features fresh produce from across the continent, got underway at the Asia World Expo today. Visitors can purchase less commonly seen fruits at the venue, such as this pink pineapple. Besides edible goods, innovative machines aimed at boosting sales were also put on display. Exhibitors coming from more than 40 countries and regions took the opportunity to build closer ties with international buyers at the event. Starting today, 20 figure paintings of the Ming Dynasty from Beijing are on display at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. Among the paintings are five grade one national treasures. This is the fourth and final rotation of the Stories Untold exhibition. Mimo Singai reports. Being one of the four masters of the Wu school in the Ming Dynasty, Tan Yin dedicated this ink painting to his townsman and friend, Wan Nao who was an important official at that time. The painting shows the departure scene of Wan, who came out of seclusion after answering the emperor's summons. Dressed in official robes and sitting in a carriage, Wan is accompanied by three servants. The Great One National Treasure reflects Tan's combination of seven song called painting style and the brushwork of the Wu school. What message do you think the artists hope to convey in this painting? It shows a gathering of five senior officials from Suzhou, including Wang Ao, and scholarly objects such as a chess set and books. The officials initially gathered regularly after taking office, but meetings later became difficult. The artists might have recorded their final gathering. Another great one national treasure is this luxurious looking fan painting that came from the hands of Zhou Chen, the teacher of Tang Ying. It depicts a mid-autumn festival legend of Emperor Xuanzong. He dreamed of visiting the Moon Palace and hearing celestial music. The emperor walks around the Moon Palace with attendants and palace ladies, while celestial maidens dance nearby. The Hong Kong Palace Museum says the final rotation of the Stories Untold exhibition contains 25% of Great One National Treasures. We have divided this exhibition into three sections. Um, they are from um, the early Ming Dynasty and the middle Ming Dynasty and the uh, late Ming Dynasty. So we hope the audience could uh, understand the stories and the uh, people from, uh, and their life of different sections from this dynasty. The exhibition will run between now and November 30th. The 20 exhibits can be displayed at the Palace Museum for only three months because of their fragility. The curator said the items need to hibernate in Beijing for a year before being displayed again. Mimos 9, TVB News. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.